Good morning, everybody. You are listening to or watching A Cup of St. Joe, where we serve an espresso shot of teaching and devotion to St. Joseph during Pope Francis's Year of St. Joseph. Today, I am speaking with Father Roger Landry, who is a priest of the Diocese of Fall River, Massachusetts, and works at the Holy See at the United Nations in New York City. I was able to meet Father Roger Landry on a little on virtual uh, a few months ago, probably about a year and a half ago, actually, uh, when Father Leo Padalinghung had a conference uh, online and brought together so many, we served on a little panel together. And then I came across this wonderful article he wrote about a spiritual classic about St. Joseph, and I thought it would be great for us to talk about that book. So I'm happy to have Father Roger Landry share with us today about Father Andre Rondé's book about St. Joseph. So welcome to A Cup of St. Joe. Great to be with you, Father Edward, as well as all of those joining us for this uh, spiritual shot. That's great. Well, that's a wonderful way to bring that in. So tell me at first a little bit, I've never heard of Father Henri or Henri Rondé. So who is he and why should we care about him? Father Henri Rondé was a Jesuit priest who was in a prolific French writer over the course of the 20th century in France. He was a professor. He wrote almost 50 books on pretty much every theological subject one could conceive of. He wrote on the sacrament of confession, marriage, baptism, he wrote on grace, original sin, personal sin. He wrote on purgatory, hell, the communion of saints, the apostolate, the parables of Jesus, the sacred heart, wrote about the blessed mother, St. Augustine, the development of dogma, Vatican I and Vatican II, Christian faith, theology of work, obedience, peace. But the book for which he's most known is his 1953 book on St. Joseph. He was concerned, actually, that St. Joseph in popular piety was the subject to devotion, but it wasn't firmly rooted. And at the beginning of this 1953 work, which was translated into English only three years later, which shows what a demand there was at the first sentence in the introduction of the book, he says, St. Joseph, is still not properly known and understood. Devotion to him is widespread and enthusiastic, and there's a lar very large number of books that seek to minister to this devotion. But too often, these writings are lacking in the spirit of critical scholarship or theological competence. And one result of this is that among the faithful, some are put off. And the aim of this book, he said, was to put St. Joseph's place in salvation history before every one of the faithful. And so I first discovered the book when I was reading others on St. Joseph, and I became aware of some extraordinarily eloquent, we call them panegyrics, um, huge uh, funeral, if you want, wanted to say it, testimonies to St. Joseph by the great French bishop, Jean-Jacques Bossuet. And I started an internet search just trying to find Bossuet's words on St. Joseph because I wanted to bring them to my prayer. And it led me to his book on St. Joseph, which in the second half of it has an anthology of so many saints and so many great preachers over the course of the century and what they had to say about St. Joseph. When I found Bossuet in there, I started to look and they had St. John Chrysostom in there and they had St. Francis de Sales in there and they had St. Teresa of Avila. They had the popes in there. And so I just said, I have to download this book, which is free on the internet. There's a PDF there and read it and bring it to my prayer. And the more I did that, Father Edward, the more I recognized that this is the book on St. Joseph. I had been waiting my entire life as a Christian and my entire ministry as a priest to find. It's very interesting because it kind of sounds to me like there's this other famous Josephologist and his name was Father Francis Phylus, I believe. And he was a Jesuit. He wrote this huge text uh, called The Man Nearest to Jesus. And he kind of puts forward all of the theology. So this, this, it seems is very similar, probably. There are probably contemporaries even, but 
but that there's kind of this spiritual, more spiritual aspect uh, to, to Rondé's text, it, it, it would seem. Now, you, you said something interesting that I don't know if a lot of people would understand maybe. And you said, I wanted to read it so I could bring it to my prayer. And so when you do spiritual reading and you bring it to your prayer, what, what does that look like? What does that mean? So for me, what it meant was to get to know some of St. Joseph's virtues at a much deeper level, get to know him at a much deeper level than I had, so that my conversation with him in prayer and my conversation about him with Jesus, his um, foster son that he raised according to his humanity, with God the Father, who chose St. Joseph to be the reputed earthly father of his son and teach him a trade, as well as in my prayer to the Blessed Mother, um, who loved him with all her heart, I, it, it would nourish all aspects of my prayer as I got to understand him more deeply. It, there's a superficial devotion that many have to St. Joseph, and I did. I, I always had a devotion to St. Joseph. I was always very grateful for his manly protection of Jesus. I was always grateful for his love for the Blessed Virgin Mary, his being a just man, etc. But I knew in the year of St. Joseph that my devotion to him needed to be nourished and deepened. And so that's why I wanted to read solid texts about him, not just so that it could uh, enter my head and help me in my preaching, but ultimately so that through my head it could enter my heart and then descend to my knees and also extend to my working hands like St. Joseph the Worker to really have it impact my life. And so that's what Father Rondé's text, St. Joseph, really helped me do. And when you quoted one of the opening lines of the book, he said it, that St. Joseph is not yet properly known. And of course, I think our hope is, is that during this year of St. Joseph, he's really becoming properly known. So many people are talking about him more and, and we're encouraging devotion. Lots of people have used Father Calloway's consecration of St. Joseph, which is a great introduction as well. Why do you think it is that St. Joseph wasn't properly known uh, in the church or to the faithful for so many years? I think one of the reasons was that devotion to St. Joseph was unmoored. And what I mean by that is the devotional life of the church took on a life of its own and was getting further and further away from the St. Joseph that we meet in sacred scripture. You know, as a Mariologist, Father Edward, that a similar thing had happened to Our Lady, in which the devotional life of the faithful with regard to Mary was becoming, to some degree, less and less scriptural over the course of time. So in the middle of the 20th century, and particularly with Our Lady approaching the Second Vatican, Council, they wanted to ground our devotion to Our Lady much more in what God himself has revealed through sacred scripture, through the, through the secondary authors of sacred scripture. The same type of thing Father Ronde was doing with St. Joseph. He wanted to take devotion to St. Joseph back to sacred scripture. Now, sacred scripture doesn't say all that much about St. Joseph, but when we start there and then we do what we call in theology exegesis, where we try to draw out from the text logical deductions from it, that just makes it rooted in steel. And so, like, let's just take a simple example. There's a difference between exploring St. Joseph under the title of just man, which is what the Holy Spirit tells us about him through St. Matthew's Gospel, and referring to St. Joseph as terror of demons, which is one of the parts of the, lit the litany of St. Joseph. Over the course of the year, I have been fascinated by how many love that title of St. Joseph as Terror of Demons. And when they look at the entire litany of St. Joseph, that's the one they focus on. And to a large degree, I don't doubt at all that the devil hated St. Joseph <laughs> because of who he was and the choices that he made and how he was somewhat impenetrable to what the devil was trying to do in him in order to get to Our Lady, in order to get to Jesus. But at the same time, I think we have to say that that title of the litany is not really found in sacred scripture. And the more people sort of focus on that, it tells me that they really want protection against the evil one. And it's fine to pray to St. Joseph for that. 
But that's different than exploring what sacred scripture says about St. Joseph and really getting into what it means to be a just man, which means to be totally right with God and right with others. And as Pope Benedict once said, to add just his entire life to God's holiness. And so that's one of the reasons. I think the second reason we can explore that for the first 1400 years of Christianity, for the most part, St. Joseph was considered to use a baseball analogy as the player to be named later in God's deal for this sinless virgin from Nazareth to whom he was betrothed. And it was only really in the 1400s that devotion to St. Joseph really started to take off as it should have been over the course of the 2000 years, because we focused so much on Our Lady's role in salvation history that to, I guess to protect her perpetual virginity, we de-emphasized her and Joseph's love for each other. Um, and what happened, particularly in the beginning in the 1400s, and then it exploded with St. Teresa of Avila, we began to recognize just what a treasure we had in the man, God the Father chose to be the father of his son and the protector and the lover of Our Lady. One of the things you draw out in your article is one of these popular questions everybody has about St. Joseph. And you just mentioned going to the scriptures and drawing out from the scriptures what we believe about St. Joseph. And our art sometimes depicts St. Joseph as being older, and that's to safeguard, as kind of you mentioned, the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin. But Rondé does something very interesting or says or kind of debunks this old man myth about St. Joseph. What does he say about the age of St. Joseph? So he, in this history of devotion to St. Joseph, looks at Christian art. And he noticed that when there were challenges to Mary's perpetual virginity, St. Joseph was being depicted older and older and older. That likewise comes from this Gnostic pseudo gospel, we call it, this heretical gospel that came a couple centuries after the real gospels were written, where in order again to protect Mary's virginity, we wanted to make St. Joseph so ancient that he would no longer have any type of sexual urge so that he wouldn't be tortured, according to the mentality of the time, living with the most attractive woman, big picture, that has ever existed because she so radiated God's beauty and love. But that was totally contrary to the custom of the time in which Mary would have been betrothed when she was likely mid-teens, 13, 14, 15, 16, thereabouts. We don't know for certain, but the great tradition is 14 and 15, as you know. And then the man who would marry a woman that age or a girl that age would generally be in his late 20s. That's kind of logical. And Rondé says that the greater tradition always said that a virgin was marrying a virgin and that St. Joseph's virtue was similar to Mary's virtue, which is one of the reasons why we lovingly call him in the litany of uh, divine praises when we're adoring Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, St. Joseph, Mary's most chaste spouse. He wasn't just chaste, but most chaste, that his love for a lady was virtuous rather than just this senior citizen with no libido. And you know, one of the things that I picked up from Rondé, which I hadn't quite thought about before I read him was, you know, we've always thought something a little bit weird about guys like George Burns, guys like Sheldon Alderson, the huge sort of donor out there in Las Vegas, these really old dudes who marry really young women. Hmm. We don't have the highest respect for them. And uh, thanks be to God that Rondé said, we can't put St. Joseph in that category because St. Joseph was virtuous, and that's what his chastity was, rather than just old and beyond sexual impulses. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that insight. And for me, you know, for a long time, I thought it was just easier to say, you know, he was an older man, he married the Blessed Virgin, and, and that kind of explained, as we know, the brothers and sisters of the Lord. But as uh, instead of kind of looking at St. At Jerome saying it's the cousins or close relatives. But 
for me, what kind of changed my mind was just thinking about all of the journeys that St. Joseph went on, that he went to Bethlehem, that he went to, uh, that, that he fled into Egypt. Like, I just didn't think that was something an old man could have done. And so I quickly became persuaded to the younger version of St. Joseph, but it was a little intellectual conversion that I had to undergo myself. So I totally uh, appreciate when people can put it forward in another perspective that I had not yet heard. Like, like I, I particularly just, loved as well, Father Edward, what it meant for him to be the mentor of Jesus as an apprentice in his carpenter shop. We don't really anticipate that many who are going to be in their 80s and 90s mm. are going to be so hard workers and providers. I, I likewise was um, of that same thought about seeing an 80 or 90 year old lead Mary and Jesus across the desert until I started to see all those fathers of the church, the great early saints, compare St. Joseph to Abraham. And I began to think about Abraham on that journey from Ur at 75 years old. And so I recognized that maybe that might not be the debunker that I wanted it to be, but sure. combined with St. Joseph with calluses on his hand, making and building things, et cetera, that, um, that was the double clincher for me to, uh, to look at it beyond just the virtue of St. Joseph's chastity that we very much want to emphasize, and particularly in this year of St. Joseph, and the challenges, especially to men, even Catholic men in the United States, we need to imitate his most chaste heart. Mm, definitely. And that's one way, you know, there's that phrase, go to Joseph, and you draw out a quote from an Archbishop of Westminster of instances in which he encourages uh, people to go to Joseph. And so in our contemporary culture, we can go to St. Joseph, especially uh, for the virtue of chastity or purity. But what are some other ways that the lay faithful, that we as priests, that all the Christians can turn to and go to St. Joseph for his intercession? I, so St. Teresa of Avila, one of the greatest mystics of all time, said that she had never gone to St. Joseph without having her intentions heard. And she was cured of a very debilitating disease when she was 26 years old. And she dared people of her own age and us after her to, to, to take her up on that challenge, to go to St. Joseph with big intentions, because he'll always come through, she insisted. And she described in her writings how many times that that had been proven true. So we go to St. Joseph in our prayer, but I think we go to St. Joseph to learn a lot of the virtues we need to love God better, to love Jesus concretely better in his humanity, to love Our Lady, and to love the various aspects of our vocation. So I'll just highlight a few. One is to go to St. Joseph in our work. St. John Paul II described St. Joseph as the very epitome, the model of the gospel of work, who shows us how work is part of the redemption. Jesus, we know's salvific life, most of it was hidden. He spent more time saving us in Joseph's carpenter shop than he did in his public ministry in, mm -hmm. on Calvary. And so St. Joseph is an incredible help in our work. Second way is he helps us to learn what it really means to be a good Christian. He is a just man, and he shows us how to adjust ourselves to the love of God, which involves faith, which involves obedience, as well as how to adjust ourselves to love of neighbor. The popes have said about St. Joseph that if you could say that we'll be waived to Jesus' eternal right if we give food to a stranger, if we give drink to a stranger, if we clothe a stranger, if we care for a stranger when a stranger is ill. And the great saints have said St. Joseph did that to Jesus himself. And if the reward to people who do it to a stranger would be as great as come and be on my eternal right, you who are blessed by my father, how much more we could say that about Jesus because St. Joseph was so superb in his chastity, sorry, in his charity. And that brings me to the third point today, which is so important because the devil really does come after so many of the people to whom we minister to try to change them from lovers into lusters, from self-givers 
into takers from protectors into prayers with a P-E-R-E-Y-E-S. Um, sorry, I spelled that incorrectly. I was spelling be champion, P-R-E-Y-E-R-S, prayers, um, that we have to be chaste, that we have to learn how to connect our attraction to others, to charity, to purity, and to piety, to reverence, that we see God in others and that we revere God in others. And once we start to do that, we never want to take advantage of them for own gratification. Those would be three concrete ways that I think St. Joseph can help us all through devotion to him, become more like him in loving God and loving others. That's, it's a beautiful reflection that you offer. And you've drawn all of this from Father Henri Rondet's book on St. Joseph. You wrote about it. I think I happened upon your article because Big Pulpit or New Advent had linked to it. And so I, I was curious. I went, I looked at it, read it, and I knew I wanted to have you on. Have you heard from anyone else that maybe took your recommendation to read this book? And did, and yeah, I guess, have you heard anyone do that or uh, probably not yet? No, actually, a lot of people wrote me afterward. Um, and I put a link to his uh, book, which is loaded uh, in, in the internet on my website, as well as this article that you wrote. And I can track those types of things, those clicks oh, sure. through, through my website. And I've seen hundreds do it, which pleased me very much. And with my spiritual directees and with others who are looking to find a means by which to grow in devotion to St. Joseph this year, I have uh, lavishly shared this text. And the feedback that I've gotten from them has been great, especially many of our brother priests who, like us, are constantly looking for ways to go a little deeper, get another angle on something that we want to make sure never becomes stale. And they've really expressed gratitude. They've found in Father Rondé exactly what I was looking for. And so I'm very pleased by that to, um, to be able to bring people to this classic that in the English language, uh, we forgot about for about 60 years. And I, I hope not just this work on St. Joseph, but Father Rondé's theological corpus, um, his many is up to 50 books, starts to get discovered by English readers again, because many of them have been translated, mm -hmm. and he can help us learn our faith better and live it better. That's beautiful. Well, there are lots of books about St. Joseph out there, and lots of people are writing books about St. Joseph during this year of St. Joseph, but why not go to a spiritual classic? And Father Roger Landry recommends Father Henri Rondé's book on St. Joseph. You can find the link to the online version in the show notes for today. And thank you so much for joining me today to talk about this wonderful book. And I look forward to probably printing it out and reading it myself. Thank you for this invitation. I love the title of the cup of uh, the cup of Joe because will be much better if we start with a cup of St. Joseph every day. That's great. Yeah. And we can just have those little uh, invocations, little prayers to St. Joseph. And that's what we'll do right now. I invite you to stay with me as we pray the litany of St. Joseph. We've served an espresso shot of teaching and devotion today about St. Joseph during this year of St. Joseph. God bless. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Illustrious Son of David, pray for us. Light of Patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste Guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster Father of the Son of God, pray for us. Watchful Defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph Most Just, pray for us. Joseph Most Chaste, pray for us. Joseph Most Prudent, pray for us. Joseph Most Valiant, pray for us. Joseph, most obedient, pray for us. Joseph, most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, 
pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of home life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Solace of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of Holy Church, pray for us. Guardian of the Redeemer, pray for us. Servant of Christ, pray for us. Minister of Salvation, pray for us. Guide in times of trouble, pray for us. Protector of exiles, pray for us. Protector of the afflicted, pray for us. Protector of the poor, pray for us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He made him the Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in thine ineffable providence did vouchsafe to choose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of thy most holy mother, grant we beseech thee that he whom we venerate as our protector on earth may be our intercessor in heaven who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.